And this is John Reed, and I'm rejoined by Esteban Kolsky. We just had a really interesting talk about your emergent business model with Alan Berkson around uh, customer intelligence done the right way there you go. Uh, with, a deep, good. with a deep methodology yeah. that you've developed. But I want to talk just a little bit about AI because we, we're here at the CC Constellation Connect the Enterprise event 2024, and while we're still on day one of the event, I think it was a pretty notable event for AI. And I know some listeners are probably a little bit jaded around, oh, wait, okay, you guys talked about AI all day. And I do think we may have reached diminishing returns, honestly, on some of these AI conversations. Yeah. But one of the things I really liked about today was, in particular, your panel on Beyond Generative AI. And the reason that that captured my attention is that I've been trying to get across to people, and I had this argument with Vala Offshore on Disrupt TV about this, is there's so much of the AI conversation is taking place within the context of the assumption that that these the probabilistic technology on which generative AI is built is the future. And so we're going to try to make it as good as possible, but we'll accept 95% accuracy and we'll try to get to 97%. And, and to me, it just feels like such a tired conversation at this point when, in fact, there's a lot of other ways you can frame this. And in your discussion, you looked at a lot of different things, including something we're going to get into even further tomorrow on active inference, mm -hmm. which is not deep learning. It's, a, it's, no. a, it's based on causality, not correlation, which right. is a huge distinction. But can you just share just a little bit to me about like what inspired your panel and kind of where you think we should go with these conversations so, so they're not just frustrating? So first off, and I'm not kissing ass here, but like you've done a tremendous job over the last couple of years in bringing, breaking the hype behind, behind LLM and providing good, accurate information for people to make decisions. And I'm very grateful that you were doing that, by the way. So, you know, and, and again, the, you can edit it out. I hope you don't because, you know, <laughs> it, it's true. But, but so here's the thing. I, I met Denise about a year ago and, you know, Denise Holt, who was uh, my key panelist today, right? And she, right. she started talking to me back then. But actually, I met her about two years ago and she was doing work in the metaverse, if you would remember that. Before yeah, that. yeah. And she was talking about this thing called the spatial web, like how, how we, we, we turn the web from being a central distribution website thing to like our phones become nodes in this special way. Yeah. Like the phone becomes, you know, independent and autonomous to, to do things. And it was a very interesting research that she was doing, but, but it didn't really have a lot of like, you know, bite to it, right? Right. And then last year, she actually partner, uh, partnered with somebody else and I can't remember the name of the company. She started talking about like- It's, uh, it's called Versus actually. V-E-R-S-I-S -S, for those of you that are searching and also yeah. do some searches on, on Denise Holt and her blogs on active inference. Anyway, continue. Yeah. And Holt is H-O-L-T, but yeah. So, so, so the thing is like, you know, so we started talking about like, you know, the, how active, uh, active inference uh, you know, was a different way to do AI. And I'm going like, are you talking about inference? I mean, we used inference in AI in the 1990s, mm -hmm. and it proved to be like not very relevant, mostly because we didn't have an ability to create nodes that were independent from each other, to, to, which is what inference need. Each occurrence should be unique, right? And, and this is something that LLM doesn't do a good job, by the way, but each occurrence should be unique and, uh, and personalized. And we didn't have the ability to do that. And then she started talking about how you merge a spatial web with active inference, and you create this model of AI that right. is completely different, right? And I was like, okay, tell me more. And we spend, you know, some time talking about it. And, and what it comes down to is like, you know, all the problems, if you look at, if you look at AI as a role, well, right? And, and I'm not trying to become erudite about it. It's just going to be like using a model that will frame this conversation. AI consists of two parts, cognition and, and execution. Cognition Correct. being machine learning, learning and all the stuff. Execution being what you do. You look at LLM. LLM is like, you know, deep learning, very, very heavy in cognition, almost no execution whatsoever. Right. I mean, you can tell by the way that that you know the answer comes back. It's not really. And I would also creative. argue. I would argue also that another limitation is a, is a severe lack of contextual understanding, and and you right. can and and you can deal with context. So the whole conversation around things like rag and knowledge graphs is about in, increasing context, and those are worthy conversations. But it yeah, does. But it like, doesn't. But let me let me just finish. Yeah. But it doesn't get you to meaning. Right. It, it, it helps show context between data right. points and how they interrelate. Right. And you can use the knowledge graph to, for example, to fix certain facts that you can't fix inside an LLM because they're not built that way. Yep. But what we're talking about here is totally different because yes, now is. 
Now you can actually set policies using this kind of yeah. approach. So for and and by policy you can, you can by policy mean a rule. I mean a rule. So for example, like but it, but the key you can't is, ask about Europe in this model, for example, right. and 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 there's no way to hack it because right. it's a rule. But, but it's but not something key, you can. It's not like a guard, a flimsy guardrail in an LLM. It's a rule. It's a rule, but the, the rule is dynamic. If you set it to be dynamic, right? You can set dynamic rules that are that are changed in context, right. change in location, change in so many things. So you actually, but it has enormous world. implications for compliance. For one thing, because yes. because 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 now you have visibility and also explainability, right? Because you can actually see the causal exactly. relationships. That so, so this formed. is not like you know a a, yeah. a, a a model that has been trained uh, at a trillion dollar cost to store all the knowledge in the world and then you go and query against right. that, which is you know finding a repeatable pattern and, and like you know re replicate it, right? Which is what most cognition based systems do. This is about the execution part. I don't care about cognition. I can find the information that I need right. when I need it. The information exists, it's stored somewhere. But I'm gonna focus on this execution. I'm gonna focus on creating this execution that is like, you know, dynamic, that is rules driven, that it has, like you said, unhackable model, unhackable parts of it. Security, right? We we're talking about service security at some point today. If you have security that cannot be hacked down at the element level, right, right at, the, at your phone, and cannot be changed no matter what. Can you imagine what you can accomplish with that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. So, so there, there's like a lot of things, and 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 you know, uh, again, uh, you know, there, there's there's like you know, there's gonna be a talk tomorrow that is gonna go deeper into this, and Denise has a lot of content and a lot of things that she put into this. But the idea here is like you know, if we try a different model based on execution versus in, versus in cognition, are we supposed to expect different results? The answer is yes, right. And the second part is like you know, is that gonna be more complicated or less complicated? It's gonna be less complicated once you understand it. And it's going to be more expensive or less expensive. It's going to be a lot less expensive once you understand it because there's no constant retraining on the model. The model becomes obsolete in an execution-based right. model. It's not about cognition. It's about execution. So then how do we optimize execution? We put it on the edge where it's cheap. We put it with the specific rules that are right. like, you know, moldable and dynamic if you need to or very, very inflexible if you yeah. don't. You put security attached to that. You put independence to each node. And you're allowed, you know, we oh, can talk, we can talk about agentic, agentic uh, AI now. You talk about agents that can do things. Yeah, the, but this these end up being these end up being reliable agents. But the, and, and and the thing is that this does not mean that all generative AI is rendered to irrelevance necessarily. Yeah. You can you can employ different kinds of language models, large and small, within the context of this architecture. It's just that, like any other unreliable narrator, you don't put it in charge. Right. It it ends up being supporting the overall goal. And so right. if the if the goal is having an engaging user chatbot, you can still have that, but but it's not in control of executing the tasks. Right. And that's what makes this kind of thing so important. But the, the, it, the, the independence, but still attached to, to strict limitations and rules and, and, exactly. and, and barriers is critical to this. Yeah, right? but I want to We're not get, protecting against hallucinations because that's not an issue because it's not content that, that is like, you know, preset. Yeah. We're, we're protecting against the ability of like, you know, malfeasance and, and, and bad actors hijacking or, or, or co-opting the, the execution and doing it different than it was meant to be done. I want to get at one really important point here, which is I've spent a lot of time documenting what vendors are trying to do around making generative AI and LLM output more accurate, which I define as more responsible because it's better output. And there's all kinds of techniques, RAG, smaller models and larger mm -hmm. models. Uh, you know, using one model to audit another. There's all kinds of stuff that I've that I've documented, and that's important. But what I've also encouraged readers to do is, on all these edges, there's really interesting stuff that's being done by folks that are just don't accept the current paradigm. They don't think it's right. good enough. Yeah. They they don't they don't, they're not going to settle for some 95 percent probabilistic system, and they don't think you're ever going to get to 100 using this 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 probabilistic technology. Active inference is a great example of what's being done outside. And I just really want to encourage listeners to do their own research on this stuff and learn because there's cool stuff happening that rejects the current paradigm, but has the same goal, which is to make our lives better by having machines that actually do stuff that makes the world a better place and yeah. not a more, you know, algorithmically screwed up place. Yeah. But the thing that I think is really powerful about active inference in particular is that it's much more closer in many ways to how the human brain works and the, and and why that matters is because the human brain doesn't require vast amounts of data to learn every new new thing and adapt to every new thing that it does. Right. And so the beauty of that is now you can start talking about AI that isn't dominated by a handful of huge overcapitalized players 
run by questionable individuals, you know, who, who dominate the market and dictate the terms of our future existence. So, so you're moving from democratizing uh, uh, content, which is what like Ellen speed to democratizing action in AI, right? A a action exactly. AI, which is what we need in the world to make a difference. Democratizing mediocre yeah. content, I would say. Uh, well, but, uh, but, but, but the point we, being, we already like, made that point before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but the point being, like, I think anyone who's rooting for a better future with AI should take a hard look at the future of alternative approaches that don't require the level of data, because it's a level yes. of data that gets us into so much trouble, both in terms of like environmental costs, energy costs, and, and the dominance of this space by a handful of individuals who really, uh, would you really pick these people to run the world? Like, you know, they, you, know, the CEO, you know, everyone knows the CEOs I'm talking about. Do you yeah. really want those people no. dictating the future of no. culture and society? And, but, but you know, you know what's more, more troubling to me? I read somewhere that the next the next model for ChatGPT will cost one point two trillion dollars yeah. to to train. The next model for cloud will cost eight hundred and fifty billion dollars to train. Why are we going to spend that money on something that hasn't proven to have, you know, limited value in a few use cases versus investing that fuck ton of money into <laughs> something that would be useful? Right. You know. Right. That's the only way I can I know how to say it because like. Two trillion dollars, yeah. dude. Two trillion dollars that we can use yeah. in, like, you know, creating better models for 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 like, you know, edge AI. That's where that's where it comes to me. Not in creating a better model. I mean, it doesn't right. matter if like retraining to understand that, like, you know, my my blog posts from two thousand seven were different than from my blog posts from two thousand seventeen, which I'm sure are part of the, the the thing because every time I ask something from ChatGPT, it comes tainted by things that I wrote in the past because it has access to that, and that's why I am, and it has access to that. So the answers will be targeted to, to what I am supposedly want to hear, right? Right. And in the case of active inference, like a lot of these projects, it's still early in its commercial evolution. It Although if you look up active inference, but, it's but actually a, a, it's a, it's a discipline There's a critical difference you made. There's yeah, a yeah. critical difference you made. The method for inference and active inference has yeah. been around for decades. Exactly. Right. right? This is just, just a, didn't find this the is just to a particular yeah. a, AI commercialized version of it. Right. It, it it exists as a methodology beyond yeah. even artificial intelligence. I mean, I, right? I, I had a, I had a, I had a yeah. vendor client when I was in Gardner in 2002 that we were doing inference-based AI back then. Yeah, so yeah, it's been yeah. around forever. We just didn't find the use cases. We didn't yeah. find the power to support it. We didn't yeah. find all the things we needed. Now we have it. In 2002, we didn't have iPhones. Right. Right. So so just so, so just stepping back from this a little bit, I think one of the main points I just wanted to make for folks that weren't able to attend the show is just. Not, not to reject everything about the current situation, but just to realize there's a lot more going on yep. beyond what you're hearing from the keynote stages. Yep. And this is well worth your time digging into this Absolutely. stuff. So that's the big thing I wanted to get across. But the final thing I just wanted to ask you was just in general, not just your panel, but what were your impressions of amongst the CXO types gathered here today? In the overall AI conversation threads, what did you pick up on? I, I, I find that they're at a point of exhaustion with the LLM hype. Mm -hmm. And that they they think that there's value, but they don't know how to get there. And I think this is the right time to introduce things like active inference and other AI models to them and other AI, AI methods to them, so they can actually think going back home uh, next week and say to their teams, "Hey, let's explore this a little bit further into other different models because we haven't gotten the results we wanted." I mean, you probably read, read the same research that I do, but seventy eight percent didn't get any results out of them. 23% got results that were different from what they expected, but at least there were results. Mm. I mean, a very a handful of people that implemented and adopted LLMs got the results that they expected and that they wanted out of them, which co correlates great with what you were saying earlier. There's a few case studies where, like, use cases where it actually works great, mm. you know? And yeah, let's use it for the use cases, but what, for the rest, let's not try to fit, you know, a, a, a square peg into a round hole. Let's try to find, you know, new models and new methods right. that will get us there. And that's that's what the mood in the room was today. That's what it feels like. All this, mm -hmm. like you say, all these C-level people are going like, okay, we need something better. What is it? And that's why it was such a powerful statement to talk about active inference and uh, inference AI based AI this morning. One of the things I try to tell people because I like, you know, because I write a lot about AI, and I, but I also make a point of writing about non AI stuff because there's a lot of cool non AI stuff in this world. But it's like they're sick of talking about AI, and I get that. I like I picked up this year less more more so than last year last year felt a little more dynamic and anticipatory this year it feels people a little weary of this topic mm -hmm. and yet there's a difference between having the same old ai conversation again about the same old stuff versus 
the right conversation. And yeah. I thought part of what good thing that happened today is we had the right AI conversation. Yep. And I, and I, I hope thought, that that's thought, what we can do. I mean, I had I mean, great panelists that really brought, yeah. they brought forth the past and the future of AI together, and they were both right in their own, in their own sense, but it provided the contrast that the audience needed to make a difference in understanding what, what, what could be better than Gen AI, if anything. Yeah, exactly. And it doesn't apply for everybody. But you know what? If you right. say, no, this is not for me, great, fantastic. Yeah. But if it's for you, at least you know now that you can start exploring for other models and methods that, that are much more promising. All right. Well, we'll leave it there for now, but hopefully we'll have more to learn because we still got another day to go. You've got a big panel tomorrow. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not doing that panel. Oh, you're not doing no, that. No, Ray's going to do that. Oh, panel. Ray's doing that what's, one. What's in the What's the future of the enterprise? The, Ray's going to do that panel. It's going to be fantastic. The, okay. the panelists are amazing. So. All right. Well, I'm pulling for Ray to to do a good job on that. He panel. will do a good job. Ray can never do a bad job on that. I I, I train them well. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember once a number of years ago at CCE, I was on one of Ray's impromptu panels where he was trying to fill an open slot that came up and he, he'd grabbed a few, he might've even been on there. He grabbed a few of us, like, you know, the usual yeah. suspects. And he asked me, he was moderating and he was like, well, what's your pet peeve? And I said, over moderated panels, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. we get, we get good stuff here from Ray. So kudos to him. Cause I think like. Yeah. The thing that I like best about being here is trying to make sense of enterprise topics, but outside of a sort of vendor campaign and more about like a group of really eccentric, interesting people, you know, from everything from like CXOs of Fortune 100 companies to miscreants like you and me and everyone in between. <laughs> and we're trying to make sense of this shit, right? For three days. So yeah. that's good. That's, that's what so. this is for. And it's a great show and I, I hope I keep getting invited and yeah. I, I hope we can keep bringing good content like we did this morning. All right. Thanks, man. Appreciate yeah, it. Th thank you, man. <laughs>